Welcome back, everyone, to IndieFest 2022. For those of you in this very, very crowded, I'm happy to say, studio, please take your seats. Uh, we are going to start the debate in just a moment. I want to repeat what I said earlier for those of you who were not uh, here. There is a no-tolerance policy here for clapping, booing, hissing, any other kinds of disruptions. There's plenty of security in the room. Some you see, some you don't. Uh, you're not going to have a second chance uh, on this, and that, that's for everybody uh, in, in the audience. Let's keep this civil, and I'll do my best to do the same up here on the stage. So uh, we're going to get started, but first I want to tell you that we're really thankful to Intermountain Health for sponsoring this debate, and I want to play a short video about them. At Intermountain Healthcare, you get quality care from Nevada caregivers you know and trust. But you also get more, more technology options to simplify and improve your care experience, more nationally renowned specialists to serve you, more comprehensive care, including preventive care and mental health support. What does getting more mean? A healthier, stronger you and healthier, stronger communities, because all of us are better together. All right, now it's time for the main event. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Governor Steve Sisolak. He's a Democrat, and Joe Lombardo, the Sheriff of Clark County. He's a Republican. I want to say, first of all, gentlemen, we really appreciate your willingness to debate. And uh, we're going to do uh, 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 a little more than an hour of debate, and so both of you have agreed to that. I'm going to ask you about some really important public policy positions. You may have heard the focus group talked about some, but also some of the nice things that you've been saying about each other. So I'm going to try to keep everything uh, on track, but we're going to start with what I think a lot of people would agree is the most important I issue in this state, and that's education. So let me start with you, Sheriff. Do teachers in Nevada deserve a raise? Yes. Absolutely. How much? Well, I mean, you got to... When, on the police department, we base it off the CPI, 2 to 3% on an annual basis, and I think it should be commensurate to, in similar fashion with that. Um, yeah, the governor provided a raise three years ago, and inflation has, you know, eliminated that raise. And I think it's important that they have a livable wage so they can even purchase a house to live in here in the state. You know, affordable housing, I'm sure you're going to ask about it, is a key issue, and that is a, a direct reflection upon our first responders and our, our teachers and our seniors and everything else that goes along with it. So are you saying that you think they only should get, if you became governor, you'd give them a 2 or 3% raise? Uh, or it depends on what the CPI and what the negotiations um, um, bring forward and what's an affordable wage um, and an answer to that question. Uh, that's all part of the negotiations. Um, how would you pay for it? Well, we'll figure it out with the existing budget. I believe, you know, right now there's $800 million surplus in the general fund. In the stabilization fund on the education, there's $400 million. Um, there's, a ways, there's ways within the existing budget streams to, to pay for it. Governor, same question. Do, do teachers deserve a raise? Absolutely. We gave them a, a raise in my first term. We definitely want to give them a significant raise in the second term. John, I have traveled this state and spoken to hundreds, if not thousands, of teachers. There's not one teacher in the classroom today that couldn't make more money doing something else. They teach because they love the discipline of teaching. They love the students. They love the interaction with teaching. But it shouldn't be that they can't afford things. I met a young couple up in, in Reno at a coffee shop and said, Governor, we love, love teaching. This is the best job in the world, but on two teacher salaries, we will never be able to afford to buy a home. Because as soon as we save enough money, the prices go up. How much should they get, Governor? If, you, if, you're, if you're Governor again in 2023, what's the raise you'll propose for them? Well, we need to do two things. One, we need to start the, uh, increase the starting wage, which will affect more teachers coming into the, uh, into the discipline, into the teaching profession. But also, teachers that have been there for 5, 10, 15 years deserve a raise. So I would think that the raise needs to be more than the 2 or 3% to catch up with inflation a little bit. No, I can't commit to an exact number but I would say it would be north of 3%. Can, can it be done within the existing budget, as the sheriff said? Not if you cut the $300 million out of the budget. He wants to cut out of the budget. You can't do it if you cut $300 million out. We can. We'll, depending on the economic forum, what their forecast is going to be in terms of resources, we should have some money to do it. And it's important to me. It's one of my top priorities to get teachers more money. You want to cut $300 million out of the budget? I'm, I'm at a loss of what he's talking about. What, what, tell, tell him what you're talking about. Voucher program. 
school voucher. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yes. did, have you seen my question, sir? No. Uh, <laughs> you want to show me? I'll many, you many parents in this state are at their wits' end, uh, Governor. Uh, uh, they see how we're ranked in funding still after all these years. They see how these school boards squabble uh, almost every meeting. They see how the public school system is, in too many cases, failing their own children. Why won't you even consider giving these parents school choice? You can't, we cannot afford to have school choice right now. We just simply cannot afford it. Uh, it's one of those things when you're getting into the private school district, they don't take everybody. You know, these charter schools, these private schools, they don't have to take learning disabilities. They don't have to take ELL students. They don't have to take the students that are more expensive to teach. We have increased our funding for education by almost $1,000 since I've been governor. We have a long way to go in terms of, of how to get there and how to get to the total. But I will stand behind the teachers in the state of Nevada. Nobody, you might say that we're ranked low, nobody has better teachers than we do in the state of Nevada. That may be true, but there's also teachers at private schools who are really great, uh, uh, teachers at religious schools, teachers. Uh, why shouldn't uh, I, as a parent, have a choice to send my kid there? You do have a choice to send your kid there. But with no public choice, money. With but no not having public money used to send your kids there. Exactly you, right. You, 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 you think public money should be used for this. When he's talking about the $300 million, yeah, now, we, now yeah. we know what he's talking about. It would take money, there's an argument, from public schools. Right, right? I and mean, the Supreme Court opined on it, and they decided that the, it was an unfunded mandate that you would bring forward. And you have to find that within the existing budget streams. It's the core responsibility of the government, education. And teachers and parents should have choices. And, and we, we should not be regulated because of the zip code you live in. And if there's a better option for you, we should make that available. But aren't you worried about the impact on the public education system? Not only would it take money from the public education system, it's, it's essentially a statement, some would say, by the governor, that you don't have faith in the public school system. You're going to take all this money, hundreds of millions of dollars maybe, and put it into private schools. No, that's absolutely false. You know, it, you know this isn't a beta program, John. This isn't something that just came out and as a possible solution to move forward. It's been tested and it's been tried in other jurisdictions. And why not bring a different paradigm forward? I mean, this existing system we're in now, we're 49th. You know, four years later, under the governor's tutelage, we're 49th. And so you have to look at different ways of doing business. So, uh, as you both know, the sheriff has presented his own education uh, program, and, and I want to talk a little bit about it. I think this topic is important enough to keep talking about it for a little bit. Let me show you something from uh, the, the Joe Lombardo education program. We can put that up on the screen, too. Restoring funding for, grade, for Read by Grade 3, a crucial program that was deemed unimportant and ultimately was defunded by the Sisolak administration. So, I'll start with you, Sheriff, since this is uh, your plan. It, it is not defunded. It's still there. Uh, you can log on to the Department of Education website. It, it, it's still there. Changes were made, though, uh, by the legislature and the governor. What don't you like about the changes? It's not a cross-the-board solution. It has to be a cross-the-board solution. It's proven. It, it, the proof is in the pudding. If they don't read by three, um, they have a 40 to 60 percent chance of failure at uh, reaching the 12th grade. And it's a viable solution, it's a viable resource, it's a viable curriculum, an academic curriculum that proves success. And why not make it widespread? Well, when you and say... have it as the standard. When you say widespread, the change that was made is to not focus just on the early grades and to spread the money up through grade 12, uh, I believe. That's, that's what they did. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're behind the eight ball by the time you get to the 12th grade. All that, those resources need to be on the front end on the developmental years, the, the major developmental years, to ensure success into the future. Governor, uh, what, what did happen, as you, as you all know, and I, I've said some of the things, Read by Three still exists, but this was a change by, by you and, and, and some of the folks yes. in the legislature from what Brian Sandoval, the previous governor, had done. Uh, and, and calling it, It's called categorical funding. And you essentially said, we don't want to do that anymore, uh, and we're going to throw the money more across the board, and you're going to take out a key part of read by three, which is holding kids back who can't read by three. That was the whole point. That was the whole point, and it was an effective holding kids back. We don't want to hold kids back. We want to make sure kids get educated. We, set, we changed the funding formula for the first time in 50 years, John. It's a per-pupil funding formula where the money is allocated. It goes down to the jurisdictions. We have not just a Clark County school district. There's 17 school districts in the state of Nevada. Every one has a different set of problems, a different set of priorities. 
We gave them the flexibility to spend the money in concert with the teachers, with the parents, with the students, get them more involved in how that money will be spent in the most effective way. In some areas, we don't have as big of an ELL problem as we have here. In some of the smaller districts, we don't have as much of a read by three program. So we gave them the authority to spend the money. We made the money fungible, it goes to the school districts, and they determine how they best spend the money. But why isn't it the state's role? I mean, you don't want to, you want to have local control of education, of course. But why isn't the state policymaker's role to say, we believe that kids need to read by three, you need to spend this money for that and not spend it on whatever you want? Well, John, when I gave the teachers a raise, I had to get into disagreement with the school boards that they didn't want to necessarily allocate the money we gave them giving teachers a raise. So they have authority on how to spend their money. The governor and the legislature allocate the money to the various districts. We come up with a per-pupil funding formula, we allocate it to them, and they determine how best to spend it. Spend it. The legislature should not be involved in, in my opinion, in the categorical funding to the extent it was, no more than they should be involved with setting the curriculum in the various schools. Uh, real quickly, I have one more education topic I want to cover, and, and that's this um, uh, Assembly Bill 168. I, I'm not going to put up a slide. Neil Mayfield of Henderson, one of our, 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 our great readers, sent in a question about this, and there's others who are interested in this. You say Assembly Bill 168 from 2019 should be repealed. This would have changed uh, the, the way that students were expelled and, 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 and punished. I, I'm really curious, though, Sheriff. Assembly Bill 168, every single member of the legislature except one, that means most members of your own party thought this was yeah. a good idea. Why do you know better than them? Because we know it's not a good idea at this point. You know, I, I, I applaud their effort and ideas to change the paradigm of what we're dealing with in, in the system that we live in. Um, but, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And I think it's a sign of leadership. Once you realize an idea that's brought forward and it's not working and it's causing more harm than good, you have to take the bold stance and say, hey, Let's change the path that we're going for. You talk to the teachers on a regular basis. I talk to the teachers on a regular basis, and it's unacceptable for them to deal with an individual that's disruptive and may even rise to a criminal act. But they can still they expel students. There. They're not prevented from expelling students. This changes the way this whole is. But expelling a student doesn't solve the problem either, right? I mean, you know, when I grew up in the system, we had uh, opportunity schools, and and. And I failed to see what the failure of that idea was. So let me ask the governor uh, real quickly. Do you think it's failed, this policy? Absolutely not. I think it needs to be adjusted. But what's happened, we've got teachers, a, a violent student, a disruptive student, can still be excel, expelled, can still, still be taken out of the classroom. But a lot of the teachers that I've talked to, they're in a situation where these kids come to school with problems. Oftentimes the problems are not a direct result of school. They're problems that happened at home. And they come to school and they act out. We need to take those students on an individual basis, try to get to the basic root of the problem, what it is, and help the students resolving those problems. Uh, just, uh, how would you, what would you propose as governor to adjust it? Is there legislation? No, I don't think it requires legislation. I think we need to do more funding. We need to get more deans into the schools. We've taken the deans in some of the districts out of the, uh, the school district structure. So we need to get more people in there in the hierarchy that can help these kids on an individual basis. If you get a disruptive student, You've got to be able to call a dean in there to be able to come in and help and deal with that student. When you've only got one or two deans in a school that's got 2,300 people, it's not going to work. So we need to get more people can deal with that student, analyze what the individual student's problem is, and hopefully get them the counseling and the guidance that they need. Okay, we need to move on, uh, and I'm glad we had this discussion about education. I, I now want to switch gears and, and talk about two very prominent individuals who are not on the ballot, who both of you uh, have either talked about or talked about the other one. Um, you have been endorsed by and embraced Donald Trump. Uh, Sheriff, he's coming, to, he's coming to do an event for you in a, in a few weeks. Um, you think he was a great president? I wouldn't use that adjective. I wouldn't say great. I think he was a sound president. I think he had policies um, that he brought forward that was beneficial to the country and, and supported the country and moved the country forward versus backwards. And under the current tutelage of uh, President Biden, we're going backwards, in my opinion. I mean, we look at the inflation and the interest rates and the policy uh, ideas and procedures and, you know, the, the fund, the, 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 the treasurer and everything else that goes along with the successful government. It, it's an abysmal failure, abysmal failure. And, and in my opinion, Trump moved the country forward. He's also said unequivocally that the election was stolen 
that the election in Nevada was rigged, and yet that doesn't bother you enough? Oh, no, no, it bothers me. It bothers me. I'm not shying away from that. Well, but you, but you still think I it's okay? I by him in that aspect. You're making it sound like it's a minor thing. Uh, it, no, it's not a minor thing. I think there is some modicum of fraud in any election, um, but shouldn't we have mechanisms in place to address even that modicum and the confidence of the voter um, in the system? He undermined the, the confidence of the voters, yes, he did. right? Didn't he? You know, you, you're never going to agree with anybody 100% in everything they do. Um, there, even in my own party, there's people that don't agree with 100% of what I present forward. But, you know, you've got to look at the totality of the person and, and their ideas and, and their leadership and support it in that aspect because you're never going to have the perfect candidate in your own mind. You don't think the election was rigged, right? No, I do not. I think there was a modicum of fraud, but nothing to change the election. Okay. Um, I see these signs out there. I don't think they're put up by you tying you to Joe Biden. Uh, uh, and, and I know you're a supporter of Joe Biden. I am. Um, do you think he's a great president? I think he's a very good president. I think he inherited a lot of problems, and you're right. I didn't put up those signs. That's a trick by my opponent to put up those signs, which I appreciate the name ID that you're giving me, Sheriff. Uh, you're welcome. I think President, thank you. Uh, so, so you did put up the signs, right? We're agreeing to that one at least? Yes, there's, there's, there are signs that are put up by the Lombardo campaign tying you to Joe Biden. We, well, why are you embarrassed? Why are you embarrassed about I'm that? I'm not embarrassed about okay. it, but then you should put on his name put up by the Joe Lombardo campaign. Let's not, let's not go off on a tangent okay. here. I want, to, I want you to talk about Joe Biden. I thought it was about Donald Trump. No, you're, t you're talking about Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden inherited a lot of problems from Donald Trump that he's working through. What happened on January 6th, the insurrection, is something that I think drove a wedge in this country that is uh, really disappointing. It's pulling people apart as opposed to putting people together. Uh, a lot of what is being, you know, he's being accused of these inflation situations are not necessarily his fault. I mean, he doesn't control the price of gasoline no more than I control the price of chicken and ground beef at the stores. So I think that the president has done well with what he's been presented with. He's continuing to move forward. And it's tough decisions he's had to make. Uh, many polls show fewer than 40 percent of the people in Nevada uh, have a, a, a good feeling about Joe Biden, but you still have a good feeling about Joe Biden. I think that he has done well with what he was given. I do believe that. I have you asked him to come campaign for you down the home stretch? No, but I can tell you uh, he's welcome to come to the state of Nevada. He's welcome to come to any state in the country. He has given us billions of dollars. We have an infrastructure meeting, which I'm glad you brought that up, John. I'm I didn't bring up an infrastructure right. meeting. No. <laughs> no, but you brought up President uh, Biden delivering uh, to the state of Nevada. He's delivered billions of dollars to the state of Nevada to fix our roads, our bridges, our schools, our hospitals, create thousands of good-paying jobs, and I'm thankful for that. You don't like how the governor's doled out all, all this American No, I don't. Grant. Why not? You know, People the, need the money, Sheriff. He, yeah, but he also said he can't control inflation, and he said the president can't control inflation, and inflation is based on giveaway money. I mean, there's been a significant, to the tune of uh, several billion dollars, been given away across the nation. Yeah, some of it's been beneficial, but... Either they're shying away with the increased inflation as a result of. You think, you think inflation is, it. you think the inflation in this country is caused by all of the money that's being, that's being doled yeah, out from the absolutely. American Rescue Plan? Absolutely. You think that's right? No. I mean, obviously the sheriff doesn't understand, and I understand, he doesn't, has been educated on this maybe, the intricacies of what caused inflation. Yes, we have more dollars chasing fewer goods. But there's a situation that the country is in right now when you're talking about supply chain issues, you're talking about issues of war overseas. You're talking about different things that all lead into that. Inflation is more controlled by our Federal Reserve Board, and the president and all presidents are supposed to keep a distance from that and not influence the policies. I, I want to ask a real, a real quick question about election integrity. You think there's an election integrity issue in Nevada? Absolutely not. And I agree with our Republican Secretary of State, who has done a great job assuring, and there's not a modicum of fraud. There's vir virtually no fraud in the elections in the state of Nevada. You still think sending a mail ballot to every voter is a good idea? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do, do you, you don't, people, do you? The more options no, to vote, John, is a good thing. Why not? You know, it's Republicans who generally have used mail balloting in the past, Sheriff. Yeah, but what's the problem with targeted mailing? Um, if you request it and you want it, yeah, we'll, we'll accommodate you in that space. And it's not that difficult of a hurdle. 
uh, to but make it universal and have ballots uh, free willy laying around and and people having access to them that may not have access to them and you rely on the on the but system. those aren't voted though they may be going to voters who aren't there anymore and they may be piling up an apartment co- but those aren't voted no well how do you know they're not filling them out people aren't filling them out and so you're hoping the system will catch it signature verification lack of, of voter ideas which is not in the place to you support help voter ID that. correct yes, I do wholeheartedly okay um, he supports doing anything we can to eliminate or to suppress the vote. I am in favor of doing everything possible. Early voting, vote by mail, re- same-day registration. Those are things that increase people's participation in the voting system. We need to do more to increase participation, not suppress voters. Even, since you brought this up, I've got to continue now. Uh, uh, even though there has been no evidence at all of widespread fraud in Nevada or elsewhere, th- th- there never has been, the more things you do, the more things you do, same-day registration, mail ballots to everyone, the more you open it up, you're also opening up potential avenues to fraud. You're not worried about that? No, John, I think that you're making a big jump there. That's like saying that the more roads we build, the more opportunity we're giving people to speed. I mean, we're giving... You think that's a good analogy, sir? I do. Okay. I, think I just came up with that, too. Okay. I mean, we're giving people more options in the way that they want to vote. That's a good thing. If every person casts their vote took advantage of the opportunity that they have, we'd be a better society as a result of that. And I'm greatly in favor of that. All right. In, in, in the time that we have left uh, uh, in, in this first segment, I want to talk about an issue that I alluded to uh, earlier on, and that's the issue of taxes. And uh, I want to quote uh, from uh, the uh, in Nevada Independent Newsletter, which is an authoritative source just uh, less than a week ago. Well, it's a very <laughs> I knew we'd get agreement on that one. In an, ad, in an ad that acknowledges high prices for gas and groceries, Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak says he has refused to raise taxes, quote, on Nevada families during his tenure and would say no again if anyone tries. So this is a serious question, Governor. Taxes were raised under your administration. Well, let me finish, then you can, you can try to rebut me. You extended a payroll tax. Uh, and, and it was then found to be unconstitutional. I'm sorry, you say extended one? Yeah. Okay. Well, it was supposed to, all these businesses okay. are expecting it to expire, and then it, it, you, you did, and it was found to be unconstitutional the way that you and the legislature did it. It also increased a DMV fee uh, that was, again, found to be unconstitutional. Uh, so, so I, I, and then you raised taxes on the mining industry. I think you'll agree with that. There are other fees that you signed, too. So I, this is a serious question. I know it's going to sound glib, but based on what's said, when did you ever say no to a tax increase? Well, I said originally I said no to the tax increase that the sheriff proposed when I was on the county commission because I had another way to fund more police officers. But eventually you agreed to that on more cops. That was just a disagreement of the funding mechanism. It was a, but it was a, a lot more serious than that. We can get into that. I assume you're going to bring up no, that. I, I do not want to revisit more cops, sir. I, I, well, I, I, want to know, I want to know a tax increase that you said no to. I said no to the increasing of the sales tax at the county before we come up with other. I mean as governor. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of taxes that were brought forth in the legislature. I mean, they didn't get to my bill to be vetoed, my desk to be vetoed, because I talked to the legislators and said, this I can support and this I can't. But everyone supported, basically, the mining compromise that was made, John. I think the sheriff supported the mining compromise. That money went into schools. I mean, we did not raise taxes on everyday citizens. If you're going to say, yes, we did extend a dollar motor vehicle fee. We did extend some fees that were already in place. But we, and the Supreme Court has since ruled, and there was a question at the time, if you remember, because LCB said that wasn't a tax increase, you didn't need two-thirds, it was an extension. So since the Supreme Court has opined and said it's a tax increase, we haven't raised any further taxes on that. You actually have this ad, and I'm not going to play it, but uh, where you're saying no, no to, to, to new taxes. You're obviously sensitive about the issue, because most people think that probably Democratic governor in his final term, you're probably going to raise taxes. I, and I appreciate your acknowledging the ad. I mean, it's a great ad. I'm, I'm proud of the folks. That, I did not that, say that. that go that on. To, yeah. uh, I know. I was putting words uh, in your mouth. Yeah, I was just kind of go step. No, I am not raising taxes on everyday citizens. That's not what we're going to do. You keep saying on everyday citizens, and I'm sorry to belabor this, but language is important. There are a lot of people that say taxes raised on corporations, mining and otherwise, extending a payroll tax, putting uh, more of a burden on businesses. Eventually, that's going to hurt okay. ordinary people. That's the argument. Well, I'll give you the argument, John. I don't know. I'm looking out at the audience here, and you've got thousands of people watching on TV. I don't know how many of them are investing in gold bullion who might have been affected by the increase in the mining tax, but I haven't bought any gold, so it didn't affect well, me. You know that's not the issue. There's well, mining then... employees. Sometimes corporations respond to being taxed by laying off employees, not giving raises. That affects ordinary people. Mining employment has increased since they came up with that compromise. Nobody got laid off as a result of that tax, John. 
It's not, you're looking at the worst I, case scenario. It's not always the case. All right. Uh, Sheriff, uh, in the time we have left in this first segment, um, when would you consider raising taxes? Well, let's, let's back up a little bit and, and provide some color with the, the governor's statements. And, you know, and I agree with you, John, in that aspect. You know, it flows downhill. I said it could. Let's not, let's not put that as my position. I said it could. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, I, well, my position is it flows downhill. Um, it, you know, you're not hitting everyday citizen, you know, the regular citizen, but if you put it upon business, it, it does hit the everyday citizen because it eventually rolls downhill and it has an effect on the business to be successful and move forward and, and provide jobs and all the nuances of taxes. Uh, so, so you would never, raise, you would never raise taxes? No, I'm, I'm in a position, and I've said it in my platform, I would not raise taxes. But, I mean, there, 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 there could be a situation where the state is out of money, where, 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 where people need, uh, uh, teachers need to, um, to, make, to make their salaries. The state has obligations uh, under statute to fulfill. Uh, and you're saying you wouldn't raise taxes? What no, are you going to do? I'm saying we've got to look. Uh, if you say there's a situation where we, you say we need to raise taxes, I say we look inside first. So you'd never we raise look taxes? inside first. And I'm at, telling you at this point right here in, in front of the audience and the public viewers, I will not raise taxes. Never? Never. So let, let me just ask you one quick question before we go to a break. So you just said you'll never raise taxes. If you become governor and, and you raise taxes, would you be willing to resign? That's a serious question because you just made a pledge to the voters. If you raise taxes, would you resign? <laughs> That's a bold question. It is a bold question. Resign. Thank you. But yeah. I mean, you're just making a very important pledge that you wouldn't raise taxes. No new taxes under Joe Lombardo. What if you have to? Then what are you going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to try to reevaluate it and figure out a way out of it. There's All right. Always, in my opinion, there's always another way. We're going to take a break, and I promise you, when, I, when we come back, more bold questions. <laughs> Welcome back to the IndyFest 2022 gubernatorial town hall with Governor Steve Sisolak. He's a Democrat and Sheriff Joe Lombardo of Clark County. He is a Republican. All right, gentlemen. Uh, you both have a lot of ads on the air, but I'm going to play, I'm going to play a couple of them uh, and then ask you uh, to answer some questions, both of you. I want to start uh, with an ad uh, th that is for Joe Lombardo. Let's play that one. Steve Sisolak's tenure as governor is riddled with corruption. Sisolak allowed a COVID testing company tied to one of his donors to skip the waiting line for a license. The test had a 96% failure rate. Healthcare experts were ignored by officials, and the results were, quote, absolute mayhem and catastrophic. Now, Sisolak is under federal investigation. Steve Sisolak, unthinkable corruption. Paid for by and authorized by Better Nevada PAC. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate committee. That's a PAC that's tied to Joe Lombardo, which try, is trying to help him governor. So let's, let's go through this issue. This is an issue that was first raised by ProPublica. We co-published it about a COVID testing company that essentially turned out uh, to be a disaster after it started. Uh, all kinds of problems, governor. Uh, the, real, the first question I want to ask, and I think this one still has not been answered anywhere I've seen, is you found out about this months, months before the ProPublica story came out. Why didn't you notify the public? Why didn't you call a press conference and say, this is going on, this is terrible, everyone should know that who got tested by them, they might not be good? We were cooperating in a federal investigation into the company, which we're still cooperating into. And I want to make clear from that, Ed, John, my administration and I are not under any federal investigation, that despite how many hundreds of times he wants to keep... I'm going to ask the sheriff on, about why they're saying TV, that. Because okay. that's simply not true. We'll, we'll talk about that. You know, we worked uh, their license as soon as we found out about it. Uh, their license was revoked. They can no, could no longer do swabbing. And they, they aren't doing testing in Nevada. They never were. They were taking samples is what their uh, function was. They came and they applied to become a processor. At the time, I want to go way back. Early on in the pandemic, John, we were uh, at a loss in terms of what the pandemic really entailed. Uh, we were advising people to wipe off their mail, to wipe off their groceries when they brought them home to, you know, take precautions that ultimately they didn't have to do. Uh, they, this company, people were getting tests, taking tests, and if you recall, it was taking a week, 10 days to get those test results back, whether you were positive or whether you were negative. It was taking an extended period of time. So we're trying to expand our testing capabilities, our capacities. This company, who had already been doing work in approximately two dozen other states, came to Nevada. They signed a contract with the city of Henderson to start collecting in Henderson. Uh, they were not licensed by the state, so we moved them up a couple days 
so they could get licensed prior to going to But they were, they were fast-tracked, even if it was just a few days, and you said they didn't do any testing. They were operating unlicensed sites, and they were fast-tracked. I mean, I understand you were, people were desperate. You needed to get testing, but you did no vetting of this company whatsoever. This company was licensed by the federal government to collect tests. They were licensed in 20 different states, and we're at a time we're doing whatever we could to get more testing capacity out into the public domain. We did that. This company, now when he talks about 96% fail rate. Well, we're we're going to talk about no. that. Uh, I know, I I'm going to explain what that. On the end, no, okay. I, I know. Well, I'm going I'm to ask. 96% rate is That's not, really is not accurate. The is entire not, ad is misleading. No, well, but let, let, let's stick to the facts here for just a second on your yeah. side. I'll ask the sheriff about the ad. Uh, I, I, I really want to know whether you think that you did the proper vetting of this company that should have been done, and I understand you were cooperating in a federal investigation, but, Governor, they, 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 they were taking swabs that weren't accurate. Uh, the 96% fail rate was at the 51 tests at, at UNR. Who did you talk to? Who did anyone in your administration talk to? People were being put at risk. The company came and applied for a license to gather tests, to do tests. They had been licensed by the federal government. They had been licensed by 20 different states, 22 different states, to collect these tests. So we went ahead and did the same thing. Now, I don't know what vetting you would want me to do, but you know, we were at a time when it was taking seven to 10 days to get those results back from people. But I never intervened on behalf of this company. They never got one penny worth of state resources, this company did. And as soon as we found out there was a problem, we immediately suspended their operations. So one final question on this, and I'll go to the, uh, uh, the sheriff. Uh, the implication throughout is this is cronyism. You did a favor for two uh, sons of, of, of a prominent donor of yours, uh, Peter Polivos. Um, this is a very large donor, by the way, and this is a guy who you and your wife have had dinner with. There's pictures that he sent out. They're all over the Internet. This is a random guy. You think it's credible for anyone to believe that this guy never asked you, told you about this company? This guy, on my life, on my mother, my children, my wife's life, never asked me about this testing company. Never talked to you about it. Never talked to me about this testing Never company. sent you an email about never it. Never sent me an email. Never made a phone call. Never sent me a text. Never did anything. John, okay. They followed the procedures. That's what happened. So let me ask you, uh, Sheriff, I, I mean, you've heard what the governor said today. Um, uh, you're, you're in law enforcement. Uh, you've been in law enforcement your entire adult life. And you keep saying that this is cronyism, and, and, and you say all this stuff about the governor implying that there, I shouldn't say implying, saying there's corruption. You don't have evidence to say that. Is there a question there? Uh, yeah. do, what evidence do you have that he acted improperly or corruptly in this matter? It's called vicarious liability, right? You're, you're the head of the agency, and you have to speak for everything that your agency does. You, you, and, and the governor alluded to they didn't do any testing here in the state of Nevada. Uh, well, then what's the purpose of even bringing the company on board? And hold on, let me, let me finish. They did do testing here. We should say they did rapid antigen testing in, in Nevada. But they never had a state contract. They worked for the city of Henderson and, and for UNR for a time. And you, you had talked about it in the original statement. You know, it waited four months before notifying the public. And the governor says, well, we were under, under federal investigation. We were cooperating with a federal investigation. That has nothing to do with the lives and the safety of the public. You should have front-facing... As the leader of the state said, hey, if you took this test, come in and get another test because the, we have determined that, that they were all false or the percentage of them, the majority of them were false for your personal safety. Wow. Okay, but, but let me build on the, the response a little bit. So we ended up, uh, they ended up interviewing with Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And we asked two simple questions. Do they have COVID in Chicago? That's where this company's based out of. And they said they could do a turnaround. The governor alluded to a 10-day window. They could do a turnaround on a three-day window. We said, well, don't they have COVID in Chicago? How are you going to be able to do that? They couldn't answer the question. So Metro didn't sign up. With no, we didn't sign up because so, they couldn't answer the question because we did a modicum of research. L let me ask you, though. I mean, They didn't supply PP&E for their, the employees, and they ended up contracting COVID. Several times, you, your campaign and the ad and the, and the PAC that is associated with it have said that Steve Sisolak is under federal investigation. Sheriff, you know, unless you know something you're going to disclose here, you know that's not true. He is not under federal investigation. I know there's a federal investigation associated with uh, North Shore Labs. But Steve Sisolak, you say Steve Sisolak is under federal I don't know that. I don't federal. know that for a fact myself personally. Then why are you saying it? 
I'm not saying it. The PAC's saying it. So why didn't, wouldn't you tell the PAC to pull the ad down? And huh? Because it's not, there's no evidence of it at all. Because I haven't seen any evidence contrarian to that, that point of view. No, John, I got to interrupt here. That, that is ridiculous. I didn't say it. The PAC said it. We all know that the RGA PAC and the other PACs that his multi-billion dollar donors put forward, he has an influence on what those PACs say, and they can't coordinate, but we know that he's aware of what those companies are saying. That's, I will that's interesting. That's interesting the governor would say that because I talked to him personally and referenced another matter, and he says, you know, you know I have nothing to do with that. That's the PAC. What, what did you talk to him about? I talked to him about the issues with the PAC, the commercials that were brought forward on his behalf uh, that was derogatory to me. That was derogatory to me, and I confronted him about it more than a year ago, and he says, I have nothing to do with that. That is the PAC. I don't know what he's... You don't remember this conversation? All right. I don't remember, I, I want, I don't remember I want, the ad, and I don't remember the conversation. I want, it was at the police memorial up in Carson City. I, I want to close okay, well, we, I Can I address the police memorial? Sure. Yeah. We had an issue with the police memorial, and Joe's talked about picking winners and losers, and this is an important issue for me. And I asked him at the time with the police memorial, I said, Joe, you honored one officer that died, got contracted COVID and died in the line of duty. I said, you didn't honor everybody. I said, I've, and today... John, today, you've got two widows in the front row, Jen Closey and Cinnamon King, whose husbands died from COVID. Officers of the Metropolitan Police Department that spent their careers on there. They were entitled to line of duty benefits as a result of that because of a bill that President Trump brought forward that said any officer that died in the line of duty, it was assumed that they would get, that they died. Let him respond to this. There's more coming. Uh -uh. That they would get line of duty benefits. The sheriff said, I did research. I, I traced those, uh, contact traced those officers. That's not how they got it. And I had to explain to Joe, that's not what contact tracing is. Contact tracing is not to determine where you caught COVID from. It's to inform people that you have contact with that you're infected. I, I, I don't want to go off too much on a tangent, but I want you to respond to what he just said. Do you remember this conversation? I don't remember him ever telling me what contract tracing is. Um, so that, that's, that's a fabrication. But let me, let me expound not- on that. Let me expound on that. So as an organization, you're required to abide by the law in the, in the definition of the law. And yeah, it is presumptive if you cannot determine it. In those two situations, uh, the loved ones, you know, and, and my condolences to the loss of life and that, and I, and I think it's very important for people to understand my position on that. But in the investigation, both of those situations, their loved ones did not contract covid um, at, in the workspace, and that is self-admitted by the family. Well, self-admitted we were, by the families okay. did not contract John, COVID. I can't let that go. That was not self-admitted by the families. And you can say as his condolences, the widows are right here. Okay. He did not even well, go well, to the well, funeral. We're going to get too much. I went to the funeral. I understand. Show respect. Uh, uh, he didn't I, even have that much respect uh, for those officers. The governor okay. didn't go to a funeral. That was after the fact, and it was, it was a political memorial theater. Service. It was political theater in order to get kudos from the family. You're telling these women that are here and their children that it was political theater, that they had a memorial service for their deceased husband and father? No, that was I'm, I'm theater, telling Joe? them it was political theater for you being there. Okay, oh. let's, 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 let's go on to something else. I want, to show, I, want, I, I want to show an ad uh, that, that, that is being run on, on behalf of the governor uh, that has to do with Joe Lombardo's record as sheriff. You already know Joe Lombardo is under investigation for using your tax dollars on his campaign. But the corruption gets worse. While Lombardo was funneling $18 million in metro contracts to his political donors, he cut 112 police department positions, even disbanded the anti-gang unit. No wonder crime exploded in Clark County. Less cops, more crime, massive corruption. Joe Lombardo, a failed sheriff who should never be governor. You think that's an accurate des- de- description of your record, sir? Absolutely not. So tell me what's wrong in that ad. Well, you want to start from the beginning? <clears throat> well, the 112 positions was a result of COVID restriction, budget constraints. Those were not they, police officers. They were not police officers. Right. They were part-time employees. Right. And since we've uh, come back from COVID, we have rehired those employees. So it's, I mean, you know... Political theater, once again, you know, you're trying to give the auspice that it's police officer, and that's not the fact. Anti-gang unit, no, we didn't disband the, the gang unit. We pushed them out into the area commands so we had better timely quality 
investigations, we soon realized we lost the intelligence functions in the investigations of the gang unit. So we reconstituted those, those particular officers for gang investigations. We didn't lose a step as a result of that decision. I, I think you'd agree that your record is... Hold sh- on. No, there's hey, one more no, piece no, no, on no, this, John. Okay, go there's ahead. one you more can, piece. I'm going to bring it up. about the $18 million right, I'm going to talk about so, uh, you know, the, the citation from the article where that $18 million was presented was on the back end of a Motorola radio contract for the police department, and that was approved under Sheriff Doug Gillespie, not myself, and it was also approved by the Governor Sisolak when he was the county commissioner, and he was sitting on physical affairs. Well, th- they're referring to something else, uh, I believe, and I happen to have pulled the agenda okay, item. Because I haven't been able to... Okay, re- September 24th, 2018, uh, the petitioner is a guy named Joseph Lombardo, the sheriff. And this is a, a, a 10-year contract for an estimated annual amount of $1.748 million. That's how they got up to the 17.5 million dollars. Uh, was this a good contract, Sheriff? Yeah, that's the continuance on the maintenance contract associated with the radio system. And is there any kind of nexus there? You get Motorola a contract and they'll give you some money? No, your campaign? absolutely not. Uh, d- different from North Shore, you know, you know, internal to Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, we have a fiscal affairs board, and all those contracts are presented to them for approval, and they go through a, a complete bid process. Uh, in case people don't know, uh, th- there is a board that oversees Metro, uh, and, and it has to be approved. So you can apply to them, but they, they could reject you. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, sh- Sheriff, I think you would, though, agree, before I get back to the governor to talk about some of this, that your record as sheriff should be uh, important in this campaign. A lot of people don't know Absolutely. much much about you, especially outside of Clark County. They say in the ad that crime, ex- the, the crime rate exploded. Now, you can do a lot of things with stats, but there is evidence that during your tenure, violent crime went up and, and it, can't, it started to come down again. Uh, there, there is evidence of some indices of the crime rate going up and others going down. Make the case... Make the case that you've been a good sheriff. For six, three, six years of my tenure, crime in totality went down 35%. The last two years, crime has increased. Last year it was 5%. This year, year to date, is 3%. And that is a direct result of legislative function that the, the, the management and oversight is provided by our sitting governor. How, how has crime gone up because of what the governor's done? Single party rule, ill thought out legislation. Soft on crime uh, legislation. But, but that's that rhetoric. Forward. Tell me something it's specific. Not rhetoric. Tell it's, me something specific that they did that caused crime to go up. The threshold associated with larceny uh, from nine hundred to twelve hundred dollars. Um, larceny numbers have increased seventeen percent as a result of that. Stolen vehicles. You can't uh, get a conviction on first time offense. Stolen vehicles has increased twenty two percent. Thresholds associated with tar- uh, sales and trafficking of narcotics. Um, and the, the basis, 90% in my, my tenure and subject matter expertise, 90% of all crime has a, a narcotics um, nexus. The so criminal justice reform, Let's just reform, make it though. softer and easier to be a, a criminal versus... Well, criminal harder. justice reform passed in a bipartisan fashion. And yeah, it did, it. because it was, it was draconian on one side until we injected ourselves to, to try to mitigate... And you were neutral on the bill at the end, and then t- suddenly you realized it might be a campaign issue. No, absolutely no. not. We were neutral because it, uh, we finally got to somewhere that we could live with, knowing that it was still bad legislation. So let's, okay, let me talk. To you. I can't let. No, no, I, no, I no let, let, let me let, let, let me ask first. You can okay. respond, but I have a question okay, for you great. first. You are on tape, and I've seen the tape, calling Joe Lombardo the best sheriff in the United States of America. Yep. Besides him deciding to run against you, what has changed? He changed. He changed when he suddenly saw a political opportunity, and this was his vehicle to climb the political ladder, and he's entitled to do that. But his priorities changed at that time. He said crime has gone up in the last two years. He's acknowledged that. That's when he started running for sheriff. I can tell you how bad crime is, is John, and your audience members will do this here. He's talking about car theft increasing. His daughter's car got stolen out of his driveway. His driveway, and the culprit who stole it was caught with in excess of a million dollars in illegal narcotics. A million dollars in illegal narcotics in, the, in that car. So what? Now, so, so what? So, 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 so that's he's a victim of crime, too. That's he's how a, unsafe it is. That's John. terrible, that's, though, right? It's absolutely terrible, and I'm glad that they captured the guy. I'm glad that his daughter was okay. I'm glad of all of that. But that is a, 
Obviously, there's regulation to the car that got stolen out of his, his driveway. And people are not safer today than they were eight years ago. Crime has expanded out into our communities. It's in our neighborhoods. It's in our homes. It's in our businesses. I met with a roundtable of local businesses that told me one of the biggest problems they have is burglary. They can't get Metro to even respond to burglaries because it's so far down on their list. We need to take our community back, safe, the safety in our community back. That has not happened, John. He's sitting oh, on 124, I'm not done. He's sitting on $124 million in the More Cops Fund that he never allocated. Go ahead, you can respond. So obviously anecdotal information, right? There's no proof in the data that we don't respond to burglaries and that's an absolute falsehood. We absolutely do respond to burglaries and the problem is we have to respond to twice as many burglaries because of the change in the legislation. And the, and the laws associated with burglary and the penalties associated with burglaries, which proliferates amongst the criminal element and causes us to have more calls for service. Yeah, you know, go, 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 go. $124 million in the more cops fund, yeah. and we're not hiring. We didn't put it in the budget, right, because we're not able to hire them because the attitude that has been proliferated amongst the public space uh, defund the police and lack of support for the police. It's not sexy to be a cop anymore because they don't feel they have support. My intent is to change that paradigm. Well, I don't know when being the requirement to be a cop was that it was a sexy position. I never advocated defunding the place. The sheriff at one point went on record and said he could support defunding of the police if we put that into. But that was an inartful uh, uh, language. That, that you don't well, think you don't think the sheriff wants to defund the police? No, do I think you? the sheriff was saying you could reallocate some of the funds that was used for law enforcement to another function that could that could help in terms of reducing crime. Why, That's why, the point he was making. Why, why do you use the phrase massive corruption in that ad? I mean, that's way over. You think there's massive corruption over there? I think there's corruption at, in the sheriff's department with the way he runs the department. Yes, yeah, so the warding of contracts, with the investigations of some of these things, with the lack of transparency that exists in Metro. And I think that most media outlets would, uh, would agree that the lack of transparency See what it costs to get body camera footage from Metropolitan Police Department. That, that's, that's a different issue. Okay, well, it's I, not I, a different issue. I, I want to switch gears in the time that we have left and talk about something that came up uh, in focus groups beforehand. It's come up a lot, and that's the issue of housing. And uh, uh, there was this congressional probe of Siegel Suites that does a lot of business here. Uh, and uh, here's what they found. They found that they failed to comply with the federal eviction moratorium or utilize government rental assistance programs and, in certain instances, expedited evictions above all else. Siegel Suites has given you at least $38,000, given you at least $28,000. I'll start with you, Governor. Why should anyone think that you're really going to do anything serious on this issue that is affecting Tens of thousands, maybe more of the vets. Why am I going to do anything about that? Why should anyone think you're going to do anything? You took a lot of money from them. What are you going to do about it? John, we have got, I've got probably 50,000 donations in my campaign this time around. I don't have one donor bankrolling my campaign, half of my campaign. That's not how my campaign functions. My campaign is based up of an awful lot of good donors, great donors, great community activists that support us. Uh, they're under federal investigation. We had uh, an eviction moratorium that was put in place that impacted all of these weekly, daily operations. And they found that they were violating that law. But what are you going to do as governor to help all these people with the affordable housing? It comes up all, over and over again. And the practices of landlords, there, there was something in Nevada called the rapid summary eviction process uh, that a lot of people think is predatory. What are you going to do about it? We've got to look at the, the overall structure, John. We have to do something about corporate landlords who have come in and bought up thousands of homes and thousands of dwelling units. Because what had happened is when the interest rates got down to zero and a half and one percent, these big hedge funds couldn't get any return on their money. So they came in and they bought tremendous amounts of residential property. They put in rental companies, they put in repair companies, and they raised those rates. And now that, that some of that property is coming back on the market because interest rates are going up and these hedge funds are going back into the financial markets. But we need to come up with a plan so that corporate landlords cannot dictate the price of rent to the extent that they're doing What's right the now. plan? Tell us your plan. I think that we need to look at the abatement procedure that exists for uh, multifamily units and non, non-owner dwelled units. Uh, as it is right now, you know, there's a 3 and an 8% uh, cap on those. And we need to look at if it's used for investment purposes only and you get over a certain threshold, maybe we should look at what that abatement is. 
So, Sheriff, we have a couple minutes left, uh, and I want to give credit to Ben Kruger of Reno, one of our uh, readers who came up with these questions about housing, including just the very simple one. I mean, what are you going to do about the lack of affordable housing? Well, it's a supply and demand issue, right? It's, it's land, 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 and you have to have affordable land in order to have affordable housing. You know, in the current plan that the governor has with the federal money coming forward, the $500 million to affordable housing attached to PLAs, you know, that just doesn't pencil out for a building. The project labor agreements right. that, that you're referring to. Yeah, it just Isn't that great, though, that they, we got all this money and then now we're going to be able to build more affordable houses? Great. Yeah, but, but if the land is, is not affordable, it doesn't pencil out. And so you, the number of available units goes from 5,000 per se to 2,500 because of all those restrictions. I think it's important that we, we have negotiations with the, the local counties and, and the trust of their land, uh, the state and the trust of their land, and the BLM availability of land and defer the cost on the front end versus the back end um, on payment for that land to make it more affordable and it pinches out for the builders so we can have the availability for affordable housing. So you let the market decide, but you have to try to affect the market? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the legislation would look like. Well, the, 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 the trust, when I was talking about in the county and the state, they have land that they have already encumbered that's on their books. Uh, give away that land. Give it to, you know, whatever it is, a dollar, whatever it may be, so it pencils out for the builders. All right, we've got to take, Wait, a, John, we gotta, I gotta take a break. The county and city are not sitting on banks of land that they can give away for a dollar an acre. It just doesn't exist. He, he's, saying, he's saying he wants to give away land, though. Uh, and so we'll we'll, we'll, we're going to talk more, a lot more issues to cover when we come back from the IndyFest 2022 gubernatorial town hall debate. Welcome back to the IndyFest 2022 gubernatorial town hall debate with Democratic Governor Steve Sisolak and Republican Clark County Sheriff Joe Lombardo. All right, Sheriff, I'm going to give you a chance here to kind of clarify something uh, that, that is, uh, the, the governor is using a lot and has been all over the place. And that's your position on abortion. Uh, uh, it seems to me you've been all over the place on this, and, and uh, I want to go through some things. I mean, in May you said you support, you'd support a referendum to move the 24-week limit that's in Nevada law to 13 weeks. Now you don't believe that. The same month, you were asked if you would support parental notification laws, waiting periods, and restrictions on the Plan B pill. Your response was, yes, absolutely, I would take that under consideration. And you said, uh, this is on an appearance on, on a KLAS primary debate, I plan to lead as a pro-life governor. Then out of nowhere, you released a statement a few days before this debate. Let me read part of it, and we're going to put it up there. Months ago, I said I would re evaluate repealing an executive order that I believed at the time and continue to believe was nothing more than political theater. Steve Sisolak is addicted to executive orders both to protect his power and score political points. I simply do not believe executive orders are meant to be permanent or should be used as a campaign tactic. However, because there are efforts in other states that could impact Nevadans, I've made a commitment not to repeal that executive order until the legislature can make clear that Nevada is not going to prosecute women who seek an abortion or medical providers that perform legal abortions, which is what that executive order did. And now you've changed your position. So here you have a chance, uh, Sheriff. Uh, clarify your position. What is your position on abortion? Well, you know, it's unfortunate the, the governor doesn't have enough respect for the voters to, to realize that it's codified in law. All right? 20, 24 um, is the number, and it's codified in law. There's nothing that the governor can do to change it. There's nothing I, that I can do to change it. And, and to, to keep uh, nipping away at snippets that is nothing more than political theater and not telling the whole story. So the Channel 8 interview, there was three questions of succession together. That's right. And I answered the parental notification one. I didn't clarify the first two questions. So there was a, a leap and an assumption that I didn't support um, the, uh, the contraceptive piece on that it just referenced the truck outside, the, the, the kids' game truck outside that I don't support uh, contraceptive. That's absolutely false. I do support contraceptive. I do support parental notification, and with the exceptions of rape and incest. And, 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 and as far as abortion, I have no intentions of readdressing the issue or the... the well, why did you say you'd be a pro-life governor then if you're not going to readdress it? Because I don't think any other additional legislation should come forward. And, and obviously this, this other piece on here, you know, prosecution of, 
of young ladies that come into the, the city to achieve an abortion, then I'm going to put them in jail. That's another campaign commercial that is out there. Now, you know, that's, that can't be any more further from the truth. I respect a woman's right to, to, for their own bodies, and there's nothing more than that. My personal belief is pro-life. That's what I believe internally. But am I going to uh, bring forward legislation? Am I going to nip away at legislation that changes that? I have no intention. It's a vote of the people, and if the people want to change it, I will support that. You did say, though, at one time, did you not, that you would support a 13-week uh, change by referendum. Did you not say that at one yes, time? Yes, I did say that. And do you believe that? No, I do not believe that. Why did you say it? Because I, um, have I thought about it more and, and, and evaluated not my political position or my campaign, as I valued, thought about it more personally, I, I support the law that the people approved. I support anything that the people approved. Um, you first said uh, 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 about the executive order that if it's in law that you wouldn't change it, which is not what an executive order does. And then you, you said you would repeal it. And now, why did you just a few days ago because say that you would Because of what has occurred in Alabama, and now other states are evaluating it. They're looking to prosecute young ladies uh, that are attempting to get abortion, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. I want the legislature to do that. And, and I, I stand by my statement on executive order. I don't think government should be ruled by executive order. It should be ruled by the people. So I'm going to get to the governor in a second. Final question then. So you're saying if you become governor, you would not propose or support any legislation to, uh, to weaken the pro-choice statute by, as you uh, use your language, nipping away at it with waiting periods. You won't propose any I of that. I would support the vote of the people. Okay. Okay, John, he didn't answer the question that you proposed to him. But let me make this crystal clear to the audience here, to the audience that's watching. I support unequivocally a woman's right to choose. Her health care decisions are between her and her doctor, not her, her doctor, and Joe Lombardo. I totally support a woman's independence and her right to choose. The sheriff has made crystal clear from the primary on, now I understand that the primary comes along and suddenly got to move back towards the center because we know how politics works when the sheriff gets poll numbers and positions have to change. But to change the position, he is a position, he has unequivocally said, yes, absolutely, he'd look at limiting contraception. He's looked at, yes, other restrictions put in place. And there are a multitude of things that a governor can he, He's right that that was a three-part question, and he's now saying, and, and, and the list was, uh, uh, it was parental notification, waiting periods, and then restrictions on Plan B. He's saying he's only when he said absolutely. Now, it wasn't clear, by the way, but now, why don't you accept it at face value? He was just talking about parental notification. And by the way, do you because support... his position has changed constantly. Do you support that? parental notification? No, I do not. So, and I can tell you why I don't. Okay. Because a lot of the parental notification ones, unfortunately, these girls are... Uh, subjected to incest, to family situations. They've got familial situations where the response from the parent could be so extreme, it could put the woman's life in danger, and that's between that woman and her doctor. You used an so, interesting uh, word when you first uh, uh, stated your position. You said you unequivocally support a woman's choice to, to uh, how right. she deals with her body. Does that mean you support abortions at 28 weeks, at 32 weeks, at 30? That's unequivocal, Governor. This is, no, this is political theater, John. No, there are very, very few cases of late-term abortion. Very, very few cases. Oftentimes, the only cases that are late-term abortion are because of the health of the fetus, the life of the fetus, or the life of the mother. So I support a woman's... If you're a woman or you're supporting women's rights, there's, no, there's a clear choice in this race who has your back. But you, you, you're saying that but philosophically, that though, if someone did need a late-term abortion or wanted a late-term abortion, however you define late, 28, 32, 36 weeks, that you would support that woman's uh, John, right I to do that. I think that's a question that is so uh, volatile that, that causes you know, a concern. I'd call nobody it a bold is, question. Nobody, it's, that's not a bold question, John. That's something that's just not acceptable. I mean, I don't think anybody... I have never heard anybody advocate for a 35 or 34 or 36 week abortion. But this is generally about a woman's right to choose. If you're unequivocal about it, she either has a right at 24 weeks or 18 weeks. She has a right at essentially any time, does she not? I do not think that she would have a right to make that decision at 35 weeks, if okay. that's what you're asking. Okay, all right. Let, let, let's move. I think the position on where the sheriff stands on abortion and women's rights to choose and where I stand on abortion and a woman's right to choose are clearly delineated their night and day.
So uh, I, I, it doesn't I, matter if they're night and day how he describes it. It's codified in the law. It's a vote of the people, and I'll support a vote of the people. And just one little more clarification: rape and incest and health of the mother. I have been crystal clear on my position on that, but yet the the commercials that is quite often presented on the on television and the media space says I'm completely opposite of that. It's political theater. It's no, like it's he not just because his supporters, whether it's Lindsey Graham, his position was more extreme than Lindsey Graham's, because his supporters oftentimes do in Arizona. They don't care about rape and incest. We've got other states are bordering but, states. But, but, but some of the ads do uh, kind of try to graft onto Joe Lombardo positions that are held by other people. Well, why isn't it enough to just say what you just said? He's a pro-life governor. You're a pro-choice governor. Well, his supporters are advocating one position, just like he is attempting to tie me to my supporters' positions. This is tying him to his supporters' decisions. Do you think that, I'm going to end this discussion here, um, uh, uh, Sheriff, do you think that essentially then there'd be no difference on the issue of abortion if you were governor or Steve Sislak were governor? Not if you go by outside the of parental of the notification, by the way. Which no, I, I, I think uh, both our positions are personal positions, and, and I support the vote of the people. Okay, okay John, we, he keeps going back to this vote of the people. The people are not voting on mandatory ultrasounds. They're not voting on uh, waiting periods. They're not voting on consultations. They're not voting on those sort of things. Those are things that a governor can impact. So he, he's talking and about those. And let's let them respond to that. Clear you can on, erode, no what you, can his erode, you can erode protection still as governor. He just listed four things. Are, are you against all those things? We'll list them individually, and I'll give you an opinion on each one of them. Wait, waiting periods? You could, you could pass legislation to change waiting periods? Uh, you could support that? Yes. You, you support changing it? I'm supportive of whatever's the benefit to the, the, the woman and her baby. But, I mean, you said you'd, you'd look at things through a pro-life lens. I really yes, don't want to... pro-life believe. lens. Well, pro-life lens then might be to, to support changing the waiting periods. Yes. Okay, so he says yes on that. Uh, uh, th- th- there's also the issue uh, uh, that th- we know where you're both on parental notification. What else could a governor do? Uh, mandatory ultrasounds. Mandatory ultrasounds. What do you think about that? What about mandatory ultrasounds? W- would, you, would, would you make them mandatory before a woman gets an abortion? No. All right, we're going to move on to another topic. I know you want to talk about abortion all night. We're not going to do that, Governor. I, I do want to talk. I do want. No, to, I just want to point uh, out the clear difference. No, again, um, sure. Okay. Well, it's not clear. Obviously. All right, let's 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 talk about something that that has uh, uh, very unfortunately dominated your term, uh, and, and that's and that's COVID. And and you've had to be you've had to deal with COVID, uh, something that no governor ever could have thought you'd have to deal with. Uh, uh, the sheriff has criticized you for too slowly removing these precautions and restrictions, saying the state quickly moved past the quote decision point. It was clear that Nevada's health care infrastructure wouldn't be overwhelmed with COVID cases. Then he went on to say, I'm going to put this up there. My opinion, he took way too long to make the decision to lighten up the economy. And it's going to take years. It's not like turning on and off the light. So, Governor, I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, the decisions that you made. Uh, some right at the beginning that uh, I, I think you have a lot of support for, a very difficult decision. We didn't know anything about the pandemic. The criticism then comes later on is that you kept the state shut down too long. You kept schools shut too, too long. You devastated the economy when the science was saying maybe you should open up. What about that criticism? That, that's essentially what he's okay, saying. Okay, and, and I wish I had 24 minutes just to answer this question, John. When COVID came along, it was something nobody expected. Clearly, I didn't expect it to come along. Uh, I thought long and hard. I remember standing on the balcony of the Grand Sawyer Building and knowing that if I sign this executive order, I'm going to shut down the strip. Uh, put 250,000 people out of work. I had regular consultations with uh, our medical community, my medical advisory team, and our business community. At the time, it was predicted we could lose upwards of 40,000 Nevadans to COVID. We still lost, at last count, 11,501 Nevadans to COVID. I'm sorry about every one of those lives lost. Yes, our business has suffered, but we have come back stronger than anybody anticipated better than anybody has Some businesses disappeared. Some yes, they did. so-called yes, they non-essential did. businesses never recovered. And, and other businesses came in and took their place. You're absolutely right. Do you regret any of those decisions, parsing who was essential, who wasn't? And so, I mean, you've got to feel... You got, do you feel that every decision you made was the right one in, in hindsight? John, you can't look in hindsight because I know a lot more information now than I knew at the time I had to make these decisions. I mean, we didn't... Everybody is essential. I mean, you know, if you wanted to have that, that argument that I, we use the term essential and non-essential. Uh, gaming figures have come back 
stronger than they've ever been. We've had 18 months in a row now in excess of a billion dollars. Our employment rate is we have more jobs than we had pre-pandemic. That's how fast the company, uh, economy has come back. Our economy has led the country for the last two quarters in terms of economic recovery. So the state is coming back very, very strong as a result of post-pandemic times. Can you argue about should it have been three-foot separations, six-foot separations, masks, 25% capacity? We're making a lot of decisions on a daily basis. What about schools? There's, there are a lot of people who think uh, that their children have been forever set back by how long the schools were kept closed. Uh, did you make a mistake there? I don't believe we did. We worked with the school districts. I met with all of the super, uh, school board superintendents. Uh, we had regular meetings to talk about this. Uh, there were certain situations that we could not take the chance of COVID getting into a classroom and suddenly you got 30 or 60 kids caught COVID. My primary focus at the time, number one focus, was to save lives, human lives. And we could have, as I said, people predicted 40,000 or more lives would be lost. I think we have some saved lives as a result of the okay. things we put in place. So, Sheriff, um, uh, being in the business of 2020 hindsight myself, it's real easy um, to, to criticize people after the fact, yeah. especially after uh, this was unprecedented, um, having to make decisions on the fly with not a lot of information. But what you're, the, the, what you're saying is that there came a point in which the governor should have known that, that the pandemic was ebbing, that, it was, that, that you could loosen up the restrictions. Tell me exactly when that point was and what you would have done differently. Well, there was, I mean, we were insular. We're not insular in this situation. It was occurring across the entire United States, and you could rely on we didn't have to be a beta agency or a beta state or a beta department. You could rely on what other people were doing in other states that were, were showing success. I believe the governor didn't do that. Uh, I believe the governor just solely relied on what Gavin Newsom advised him on. Oh, that, that, but that's, that an easy, that's an easy political shot, saying Gavin Newsom. There were out-of-state out state people question. consulting here, too. And, you know, a, a big uh, component of this, the decision point, in my opinion, and in my own observation, was the overwhelming of the medical services. Um, were the medical services getting overwhelmed in the early throws? Yes. All right, but we soon were able to manage that into the um, and how we could deal with that uh, with the COVID infection rate, and and then along with that, businesses should have started opening. I know personally that uh, Matt Maddox over at, at Wynn had a pretty uh, progressive uh, remediation program that he presented to the governor, and it fell on deaf ears, and 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 the casinos didn't open sooner than later, and there was a lot of mechanisms that were out there. Um, that could have uh, caused us to open the economy. Weren't, weren't most of the casinos generally supportive of the governor's policies throughout, even shutting down, which was... Yeah, a, that, that, they, the, weren't they generally supportive, including the, Matt Maddox, by the way? The hard decision wasn't to shut it down, because we didn't know what we didn't know. I agree with the governor on that, but in short order, we did know. And so the hard decision was to manage it. And I believe the, the, the decisions that the governor made were too draconian, and it caused this longer-term strife. Um, we, we were caught up in the COVID malaise and the economy and, and the mortality much longer than we should have been. Okay, so, Jet, go, go ahead. Okay. I talk to Matt Maddox regularly. Matt Maddox was part of the team that we consulted with on casinos. He's a former CEO of Wynn, in case Wynn people results, don't know. Right. If anybody thinks we wanted to close the economy down and keep it shut down, that's ludicrous. We wanted that's not to get what people I said. back... That's as quickly as we possibly could. We had regular injuries. You didn't open it as quickly as you possibly You could have opened it earlier. And you we could have, have made lost 15,000 lives instead of 11. You're right, John. Those lives were more important to me. The economy came back. Those lives we could never regain. There's 11,501 empty dinner seats at Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner right now. That's what it is. So the argument he's making, Sheriff, um, is that... Uh, Let's err on the, side, on the side of doing too much, what you would say is draconian, to save lives and hope that the economy can come back afterwards. Why doesn't that make sense? Because he failed to put mechanisms in that would benefit in that decision. An so, example so be is the proliferation of the vaccine, okay, and the distribution of the vaccine into all the state of Nevada in particular areas. Uh, the state government and the local government tried to encompass that and have total control over that distribution without bringing in the private sector to solve this issue, and in particular Optum. Optum said, hey, we can help you with this, 
And it falls on deaf ears until it becomes insurmountable and we can't process it soon enough. Can you pinpoint it, Sheriff, since, uh, since you're talking about this decision point? And, and I want to try to get, when was the decision point where he should have done more than you think he should have? Well, I, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. I can't quantify it here. But that's what you said. Stage, I, I, that was the hey, quote. That was the quote from the hey, Gazette Journal. When the medical services were, uh, we knew were not going to be overwhelmed. Sure. John, uh, we opened up a hospital, basically, in the parking garage at Renown Hospital. That's how short of rooms were. UMC, they were in the hallways taking care of patients. The medical community was overrun. This is a lot of this was pre-vaccine, if you go back to this. I do want to cover one other aspect of this, because we don't have much time left, Governor. And, and well, I know we opened a hospital in the uh, hang on, parking sure. lot of Cashman Field, and, and, and at one point, the maximum occupancy was five people. Let's, we can argue about this all day. We're not going to do that. The other aspect of this that, that I know has been painful for you and you've, has, has brought you a lot of criticism is the handling of unemployment, the crushing unemployment right. that occurred, and then the criticism of your administration for, for uh, the unemployment system essentially collapsing and people not being able to get checks. Uh, the people still talk about that. Uh, and, and you tried to do something about it in a special session in 2020. Let me tell you what you said. You said, this piece of legislation is not a silver bullet or the final word, but there is no doubt that it will help Nevadans for both the short and long term going forward. The challenge, however, is what you called an antiquated system, one that has been unprecedentedly overwhelmed. It is an antiquated system. You're absolutely right about it. It was unprecedentedly overwhelmed. But I think the criticism would be, Governor, is you knew when you shut down the strip and everything else that it was going to be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you prepare better for that? We, well, and, and I can accept what you're saying, John. We did what we possibly could. The system was dealing with we got more com, uh, claims in a week than we would get in a year normally. In a week than we would get in a year. There were hundreds of millions of dollars of fraud perpetrated on Nevada, billions nationwide. We didn't have enough claims adjusters because you couldn't have 500 claims adjusters just picking a number two years ago when there was no need. But to then, was there any conversation that took place? Oh, we're going to shut down the state. We're going to have, this place is going to be flooded. Yes, we did. We brought in people from Health and Human Services. They weren't trained in the specific role of claims adjusting. Now. It hurt businesses. But that being said, I worked with the business community. The Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce would not endorse me if they didn't think that we worked hard. It didn't just hurt businesses. It hurt a lot of employees. It hurt a lot of employees. People were out of work, and suddenly right. they couldn't even get, they couldn't, they got that again. They got a recording. They got a busy signal. They couldn't get their checks. They couldn't, John. You're right, because we had hundreds of millions of dollars of fraudulent claims that ultimately small business has to pay for. Small business, that comes out of our fund. So that half fund has to be replenished. I prevented a rate increase from going through to make them pay that. He did mention this, so I'm going to mention it too. He slipped it in there that the Chamber of Commerce uh, has endorsed him in, 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 instead of you. Uh, and so it, it, they, they must be saying, you know what? It was a terrible situation, but he did all he could. Yeah, it's unfortunate, right? It's unfortunate they're saying that. But, you know, the Chamber of Commerce is directly related to small business, which is the backbone of any economy or any state. They endorsed him. That's why they're they endorsed him. Let, so let, much I can handle this. They, Thank they, you. They, <laughs> they, they, they endorsed him. Yeah, that's, and like I said, that's unfortunate. You know, in, in my own intelligence, uh, we, I referenced the interview, the, there was numerous people uh, as part of the board that was um, endorsing me and in my camp, but yet they got overwhelmed by particular powers that are, are in the governor's pocket. What, what does that mean? Who's in the governor's pocket? The people that um, are, have a significant investment on his reelection. You got you got to say more, sheriff. I mean, you're in law enforcement. There, you can't just throw out a charge you know, like it, that. It's always it's always been said out there, and it's no secret, you know, that the governor is vindictive, and and if you don't come on board, he's going to make your life tough. So g give us an example of that, then. Huh? Now, Joe, I, I mean. To make an allegation like that, I'm not going to come forward with the nicknames they gave you at Metro. Go ahead. About your I don't care. I got thick skin. Uh, about, about Bring them forward. John, Bring them forward. Delve into this. I, you the know, I, that they're in my pocket is absurd. The Chamber of Commerce is a well thought of business organization, the voice of small business, and to say that they're afraid. Uh, I think that's... I, I, don't, I don't want to spend the last couple minutes of this well, debate. How can, no, how but, can no. you close down 95,000 businesses and, sure. and, and uh, support the individual that caused... Because the well. person who helped close those businesses saved tens of thousands of lives. And the Chamber of Commerce understood that. I was in regular communication 
with the medical okay. and the business. I, I'm going to ask a couple more quick questions, and, and then we're going to have to get out of here. And I have to ask a, a, a health care question. Do you support the public option bill? No, I do not. Why not? Because we're already in a, a dire straits with Medicaid and currently in, within the state of Nevada. The state has failed to address the Medicaid reimbursement model, which is one to two to the federal government. And that's just a lesser form and a bigger problem. A study just came out that said it would save the state hundreds of millions of dollars. No, it wouldn't save the state anything. It would save the people that have the insurance, the money. The state is already in dire need to keep doctors here to provide quality medical care. We are the lowest state in the nation on uh, Medicaid reimbursement. And public option is only going to make that situation worse. So we've got 30 seconds left. Uh, you know, we're, I think we're only the third state to, to implement this. Right. It's still not implemented 2026, It'll I be think. 2026. It will save, it's estimated, it will have in excess of 50,000 people going that on year one. Uh, it should save 15,000. Well, no, no one else is doing this, essentially, in the country. Why should oh, we do it? Other states will do it by the time it gets to 2026. So? Other states aren't taking implement, our, uh, proaction to save water, like we are in Nevada. We're leading on that front. We're doing a lot of things on the forefront in Nevada. We're cutting edge. We're, we've got some things that we're on the top of. Well, we, we are out of time. There's so many other topics to cover. I, I, I really appreciate both of you gentlemen taking no, all this time you, uh, to have uh, this debate. And appreciate everybody here in the studio and watching uh, for the IndyFest 2022 debate. In a few minutes, if you're watching here, we're going to see what the focus groups thought of the debate. Stick around. Hi, everybody. I'm Reed Cowan from News 3 Las Vegas. We want to thank you for checking out our YouTube channel. Remember, you can always see more of our videos by clicking on the video links. And also don't forget to click that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any of our YouTube updates. Thanks for watching.